Order. I uh, call this meeting to order. This is the uh, Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs. Uh, my name is Chris Palmer, MLA for Kings West, and I'm the chair of the committee. Today we will hear from presenters regarding the use and availability of Veterans Affairs Canada long-term care beds in Nova Scotia. Uh, I'd like to ask all those in the room if they could please this time make sure that your phones are turned off or put them on silent so we don't have any uh, uh, interruptions. And at this point I'd like to ask all of our committee members uh, beginning to my left with MLA Barcos to uh, introduce themselves and their constituencies please. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Danielle Barcos. I am the MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Good afternoon everyone, Trevor Boudreaux, the MLA for Richmond. Good afternoon, Larry Harrison, Colchester, Muscat, Abbott Valley. Good afternoon and welcome, Tom Taggart, MLA for Colchester North. Hi, I'm Gary Brill, I represent uh, Halifax, Shabakto. Good afternoon and welcome everyone, now Tony and Sam LA for Coal Harbor. And I'm Ben Jessam, I represent the community of Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you, everyone. And for uh, the purpose of Hansard, I'd also like to recognize the presence of Legislative Council Philip Grassi to my left and Legislative Committee Clerk Tamar Nuseba to my right. So as I mentioned, our topic today is the use and availability of Veterans Affairs Canada long-term care beds in Nova Scotia. Welcome to all of our guests here today. I'd like to uh, give you all an opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, who you represent, the organization, and then we'll go across the table with a brief introduction of, of who you are, and then I'll come back to the table for opening remarks. So we'll begin with Ms. McCluskey. So I'm Lynn McCluskey, and I'm the national manager responsible for long-term care and the Veterans Independence Program. Good afternoon, I'm Stephen Harris. I'm the Senior Assistant Deputy Minister for Service Delivery with Veterans Affairs Canada. Good afternoon, I'm Eileen McGibbon, Vice President of Operations for Central Zone with Nova Scotia Health. Good afternoon, my name is Brett McDougall. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Eastern Zone, Nova Scotia Health. Good afternoon, I'm Heather White, and I'm the Health Services Director for Camp Hill Veterans Services and Geriatrics here in Central Zone, Nova Scotia Health. Good afternoon, I'm Don McCumber, President of the Royal Canadian Legion, Nova Scotia Nunavut Command. Thank you, and uh, we'll uh, now open the, the head table for uh, some opening remarks. So Mr. Harris, if you'd like to begin, go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you again, Mr. Chair and committee members for inviting us to appear on the topic of long-term care. My name again is Stephen Harris. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Service Delivery within Veterans Affairs Canada, and I'm joined by my colleague, Lynn McCluskey, responsible for as a ma national manager for long-term care. Veterans Affairs Canada supports the well-being of veterans and their families through the delivery of programs such as disability benefits, financial benefits, rehabilitation, support at home, and by commemorating the achievements and sacrifices of Canadians during periods of war, military conflict, and peace. Our work is influenced by many factors, internal and external. The programs and services we deliver are impacted by broader policies and the priorities of the Government of Canada, and we must adapt to the needs of the people we serve. At the same time, the management and direction of programs and services relies on people, budgets, processes, and tools. All these factors play a central role in our programs and services. Our priority is to make sure Canada's veterans have access to the programs, services, and support they need, when and where they need it, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. The veteran population covers a wide range of ages, from people in their early 20s to some over 100 years of age. Many VAC clients have physical and mental health injuries with varying needs when it comes to support. Some individuals may need physical rehabilitation. Some are looking for support to enter the workforce, while other veterans need the support of long-term care facilities. As we know, long-term care facilities support those who can no longer care for themselves for long periods of time. VAC provides financial services to eligible veterans who need long-term care. Veterans are able to receive support through contract beds or community beds. Contract beds are designated through contractual agreements with provinces, health authorities, and or facilities for priority access of war veterans. Priority access in this case means that a war veteran will receive priority for admission to the next available contract bed, regardless of how long they or non-veterans have been waiting for admission to the facility. There are various funding agreements in place for contract beds across Canada. In Nova Scotia, VAC covers the full operational costs, including staff, heat, lights, as well as enhanced programs and services that are not typically found in nursing homes. These programs and services may include physiotherapy, musical therapy, or palliative care. Community beds are available to veterans as well as other provincial residents. When a veteran resides in a community bed, like a contract bed, Veterans Affairs provides assistance by subsidizing the veteran's monthly accommodation and meal costs so that the maximum any veteran contributes 
towards their residential fee is $1,221.10 a month as of October of last year. Veterans Affairs pays the full accommodation and meals for veterans who are in the care as a result of an injury or illness suffered related to service. Also through a means test, veterans who have a spouse or common law partner may have a reduced contribution from zero to that $1,200 figure per month. Veterans Affairs supports just about 2,000 veterans in more than 700 nursing homes and other long-term care facilities across Canada. In Nova Scotia, we support the full cost of care for 135 veterans in contract beds and preferred admission beds at Camp Hill, as well as for 107 veterans in community beds for a total of 242 veterans receiving Ve Veterans Affairs departmental support for long-term care. Although Veterans Affairs pays the full cost of care for the Nova Scotia veteran community beds, the assessment and placement of veterans into these beds is res the responsibility of continuing care services at the province. Veterans Affairs has developed collaborative and working relationships with the staff at the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the department responsible for seniors in long-term care. We will continue to work with our provincial and local health authority partners to ensure that our veterans are receiving the care and support they, receive, they deserve. Lastly, we're committed to adapting the ever-changing environment as the needs of Canada's veterans and families evolve. The Department appreciates the collaborative work with others as the responsibility of veterans' well-being is shared with multiple jurisdictions, other government departments, and individual veterans. We will work to ensure that complementing and supplementing all of the positive work done for veterans in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I uh, believe, Mr. McDougall, you have opening remarks to give? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Brett McDougall. I'm the uh, Vice President of Operations for Easter Zone, Nova Scotia Health. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to meet today. Caring for veterans who proudly serve our country is a true privilege. And I hope now to walk you through our role in providing this important care. Nova Scotia Health has a contractual obligation with Veterans Affairs Canada to provide eligible veterans in 131 designated beds located in seven facilities across Nova Scotia Health. Eligibility for these beds is determined by Veterans Affairs Canada. And access to those beds is, a co is coordinated through Veterans Affairs Canada, or VAC. When a VAC bed opens up in one of our Nova Scotia Health facilities, we inform VAC, they advise if there's an eligible veteran in need of a bed, and if so, we work together to facilitate admission into that bed. The total operating budget for these 131 beds in seven facilities is $18,328,207. It is provided through Veterans Affairs Canada. In Central Zone, there's one Nova Scotia Health facility with VAC beds. Camp Hill Veterans Memorial Building in Halifax has 108 VAC beds. All beds are currently occupied by veterans. In Eastern Zone, there are two Nova Scotia Health facilities with VAC beds. Tyna Mara and Glace Bay has four beds, all occupied by veterans. Harborview Hospital in Sydney Mines has three beds, two occupied by veterans, and one is currently vacant. In Western Zone, there are three Nova Scotia Health facilities with VAC beds. Fisherman's Memorial Hospital in Lunenburg has four VAC beds, all occupied by veterans. Yarmouth Regional Hospital in Yarmouth has five beds, all occupied by veterans. Soldiers Memorial Hospital in Middleton has four contract beds, all occupied by veterans. In Northern Zone, there is one Nova Scotia Health facility with contract beds. Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital in Picto has three contract beds, all occupied by veterans. Based on these numbers, Nova Scotia Health is currently operating 131 VAC beds with 99.2% occupancy rate, which translates into 130 beds occupied by veterans and one vacancy. Our strong interprofessional clinical care team are dedicated to meeting our clinical mandate to provide outstanding quality long-term care and service to veterans in alignment with Accreditation Canada, Standards of Excellence, and Nova Scotia Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care Facility licensing requirements. Before closing, on behalf of Nova Scotia Health, I would like to acknowledge the partnership, the positive partnership we have with both Veterans Affairs Canada, the Royal Canadian Legion. We are fortunate to work closely with both parties and appreciate the impact their many contributions have on our veterans our facilities and our communities. This support directly impacts our ability to provide the highest quality of care to our veterans in recognition for their service to our country. I hope this information has been helpful. We look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Mr. McCumber. <clears throat> Thank you. I welcome this opportunity to appear before the Provincial Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs. 
I wish to speak on the topic of long-term care and how the present policies and procedures in place are having a dramatic effect on our veterans' facilities that are located within our command. That is in reference to those veterans that have served in the Second World War and the Korean War, as well as those since that have served within our Canadian Armed Forces and may wish to locate within these facilities. Many of these veterans do not fall under the present guidelines that have been established by VAC. At present, we know there has been a drastic decline in the occupancy of veterans within these units. The following is an update of information I received to date in comparison to the 2018 report excluding Camp Hill and Northumberland. Of the 124 contract beds as of 2018, we've noted that approximately 22 are occupied by veterans. The remaining 102 beds are currently uh, occupied by non-veterans. This leaves veterans requiring beds to be placed in waiting. <clears throat> in one case, a decorated Yarmouth Korean War veteran was left waiting for two years for a bed, even though he qualified under the current definition. In another example, we have a post-Korea veteran who served honorably between 1954 and 1970 with postings to Germany and two tours in Cyprus who does not qualify for a veteran's bed under the definition within his local community of Yarmouth. It would be safe to say that even with the lack of veterans within these facilities, you would find that most beds are fully occupied when you include those non-veterans in the list. We feel this situation has come about with an agreement made between Veterans Affairs and the Nova Scotia Provincial Health Authority that they could place into these units those who they choose when a veteran bed became vacant. Reviewing minutes of Hansard of 2018, I quote the comment to the procedure in place at that time for filling vacant beds. We do have the ability to utilize those, referring to vacant beds, for temporary transitional care, and so traditionally they are used for individuals who may be in hospital waiting discharge to the community or waiting placement in a community-based nursing home, so a similar level of care and support." End of quote. Now, those non-veterans are held within these units on a permanent basis. <clears throat> veterans who qualify for these beds may never be admitted due to a long wait time for admittance. As we all know, these veterans' facilities were set up to accommodate our veterans. These facilities provided not just health care, but a place for them to enjoy a sense of comradeship while living within their own little community. Close by are legions that lend support to the veterans and the units. That support has been through the raising of funds for vans to take them to various legion and community events, social gatherings within these units, as well as providing additional personal comforts that they may need that are not provided by VAC. The legions have and can continue to be a great asset to these facilities. We owe so much to all that served and are serving in our defense and for our democracy. The least we can do is to ensure that we provide all veterans with the comforts and the quality service provided that service provided within these units when the need arises. Nova Scotia Nunavut Command's solution is twofold. If the Provincial Health Authority has the authority to place into these units whomever they so choose, as they have been doing, when a bed becomes vacant, we suggest a reversal of the present situation. And when a non-veteran bed becomes vacant, that priority be given to a veteran that may be available. That is whether they fall within the current criteria or not. Thus, in the future, we would have these facilities housed by veterans. Those that fall under the guidelines of VAC would continue to receive the present benefits, and all other veterans would fall under the provisions of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Further, we suggest 
as Veterans Affairs Canada has introduced the preferred admission bed program within Camp Hill Hospital, that this program be consistent throughout all the veterans' units within our province, thus making long-term care accommodation available to all veterans that have honorably served. In one of our 100 branches from Yarmouth to Cape Britain, we've identified seven veterans in their 90s and 47 veterans in their 80s that have the potential to be placed in a veterans unit. It is certain that veterans wish to be housed within these facilities. However, they may not ever be given the chance under the current criteria. I thank you on behalf of all the members of Nova Scotia Nunavut Command and all our veterans for the opportunity to address this committee and thank you for the past opportunities to discuss with you our concern as they relate to our commitment to those veterans that we are honoured to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCumber, and so we look forward to the conversation this afternoon. Just to give you an idea of how the committee process works here, each caucus will have 20 minutes of questioning to our witnesses, and then uh, we'll go start with the Liberals, the NDP, and then the Governing Caucus. Uh, I may, I will have a hard stop at the end of 20 minutes, so just a little bit of a uh, warning that if you are speaking, and I do have to call order. It's not that we don't want to hear. I just have to stick to the, the 20 minutes. Uh, so just giving you an idea that that may happen. Uh, so other, we will end questioning at around 20 to 4, 3.40, and then uh, we'll have a closing statement at that point in time. So we will now begin our questioning with the Liberal Caucus, MLA Ince. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, everyone. Uh, my question is for Nova Scotia Health. Um, there was recently a water break in the Halifax Infirmary, which impacted many people, staff, patients, and so on. Um, in, and this also affected Camp Hill. So my question is, what is the current status with Camp Hill, and are all the residents safely back in their, um, in their place? Ms. White. Sure. So thank you for the question. Uh, it certainly was a, a challenging week for sure, but very uh, happy to share that uh, all the veterans and residents at Camp Hill were able to be safely cared for throughout uh, the water main uh, break. And uh, we're happy to have full water service back now, with the exception of we still have some limited fire suppression capacity, so we have additional fire watch in place, but our drinking water and uh, water for flushing toilets, et cetera, is all uh, back online. And, uh, and, and I'm really proud of our teams and how well uh, they came together and supported and, uh, and our facilities teams who worked really hard to, uh, with many community partners to make, uh, to restore service quickly. Emily Inns. Um, with that, um, will the pipes be fully serviced and upgraded? Do you have any idea on that? Uh, Ms. McGibbon. Oh, sorry, Ms. McGibbon. Thank there you. we go. Work was already underway for a full replacement of part of that component of our infrastructure. So it, it, the, the water main break, unfortunately, preceded that work. So that work is well underway, had been, and will continue to, to a, a, a full replacement uh, towards the end of this summer. MLA Jessam. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to jump over to Mr. McCumber just to just to clarify, Mr. McCumber, you referenced a couple of advocacy items. The first, um, the province has the authority to place civilians when a vet bed becomes available. Um, the Legion would like to see this a reciprocal agreement uh, offering preference to veterans for civilian beds. Um, the, well, can you just go back to the second item that you, you referenced there with respect to the pr preferred admission? Mr. McCumber. Yeah. 
Okay, just to give you an example, in speaking of the Yarmouth facility, Veterans Place, which I'm familiar with and live close by to it, there were at one time, there were 15 contract beds there. And they were allotted for veterans that fall under the, the, the uh, guidelines of being a Second World War veteran and uh, Korean War veteran. So as a bed became vacant, as we know, Veterans Affairs turned over the responsibility to the, the province to uh, temporarily house a, 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 a patient or a non-veteran non in one of, those, one of those units. So as we have uh, uh, proceed, uh, progressed through the years, uh, we now have five veterans that qualify to be there and 10 non-veterans that are in that, that wing right now. So as, as I mentioned, so when a veteran uh, comes along that uh, is entitled, we'll say, a, as a Second World War or Korean War veteran who is assessed by continuing care to go into that facility, there is no space for them. We, we can't go in there and certainly in, and demand that one of those individuals be removed because they may not have a place to go to at this point. So in order to reverse that trend, as I've suggested, is that if the Nova Scotia Health Authority has the authority to put in there those that they, they uh, recommend or are assessed, then let's make it a veteran so that down the road as one of those individuals moves out, we're moving in a veteran uh, into that f facility. So that's the, you know, that's the, the situation with, with that. With regards to preferred access beds, it's my understanding that Veterans Affairs had made an agreement with Camp Hill to open uh, these uh, preferred admission beds to, that would accommodate those veterans. However, uh, that does not apply to other facilities across the province because Veterans Affairs has not come down to, you know, to, or to make a, an arrangement with Yarmouth or Middleton or Fisherman's Memorial, any of those places to say, yes, we've designated so many beds uh, to Camp Hill, um, we will designate uh, 10 beds in Yarmouth or eight beds in Yarmouth that would be preferred admission beds that they would be cared for under VAC. Emily Jessen. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Mr. McCumber. Um, perhaps our friends from uh, Nova Scotia Health or Veterans Affairs could comment on the, um, I guess, the, if there's a wait list for a space. I understand that there's one vacancy in across the province um, with the existing uh, in, entitled beds. Um, is there, are there people waiting for space through the chair? So that would be, uh, okay, Ms. McCloskey. So currently, uh, we have two veterans awaiting placements to contract beds in Nova Scotia. Um, both of those veterans are awaiting placement to Wind Park Villa in Truro, uh, which is not part of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, and one of those veterans is currently in long-term care and wants a transfer, and the other is in a hospital awaiting placement. We have five contract beds at Wind Park Villa. We have had five contract beds at Wind Park Villa for um, more than 15 or 20 years, and they are currently fully occupied. As a veteran vacates one of those beds, then they would have the next available bed that would come. Other than that, it is my understanding that there are no veterans awaiting placement to a contract bed. Emily Jessen. Thank you. And to, to Mr. Mr. McCumber's um, advocacy for um, kind of that reciprocal uh, nature, if if beds are filled, is there? 
maybe Nova Scotia Health, but um, is there flexibility within the current system to, to, to make that type of move to ensure that if there is a wait list and there are there a bed, a, I guess a general gen pop vet bed becomes available that there's pro, uh, preference provided to the veteran that would have otherwise moved into a, a preferred access bed. Mr. McDougall. I think it would be important to note that Nova Scotia Health is the operator of, of beds. Uh, whether a veteran through Veterans Affairs Canada um, is identified and therefore uh, placed through a, a, a wait list management through Veterans Affairs Canada, we, they would determine whether or not that patient would come into a Veterans Affairs bed within the existing Veterans Affairs beds that we have in relation to Nova Scotia Health. If it's a patient that it would be determined or uh, reviewed through a seniors and long-term care uh, in collaboration with Nova Scotia Health Continuing Care, then that would be a determination through seniors and long-term care on the next available patient based on patient needs that they would then tell us when and who and how we would take that patient into one of our other existing long-term care beds. So just, just for clarity, we don't have the authority to change policy or procedure. Uh, we, work, we work both with Veterans Affairs Canada and Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care, and either, either organization in partnership with us tells us how the patient would enter into an existing bed that we provide services to. Emily Jessen. Thank you, through the chair. Appreciate the appreciate that response. Um, so there is, it, as I, I guess, I, I what I'm what I'm understanding is there is a a, a preferred method of bringing civilians into long to, or to I guess to take the place of veteran preferred access beds, uh, but there is not a reciprocal agreement that's, I guess, that, that's, a, that's available to use. It's it just subject to, I guess, the, the directive of VAC. Can you, can you just clarify that through the chair? So, so, so would that be Mr. McDougall? Okay, Mr. McDougall. Thank you. So for Nova Scotia Health, we become aware that we have a vacant VAC bed. We communicate that vacancy to Veterans Affairs Canada. And based on a wait list that Veterans Affairs Canada would hold, they would then determine who the next patient from Veterans Affairs Canada would come into our facility, and then we would welcome them into our facility. But the determination is made through a Veterans Affairs Canada process. MLA Ince? Okay, MLA Ince. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I can get some clarification. I'm a little confused. Um, Mr. McDougall, in your remarks, you've highlighted that we've got 131 beds. Um, Mr. McCummer, is highlighted 124. Now, I'm asked, wondering, is this number as a result of the 2018, or are your numbers more up to date? I'm a little confused, because there's discrepancy in who's in the beds based on the two remarks. Mr. McDougall. Sorry, Mr. McDougall. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to coming to the committee, we, we went through an exercise to identify which beds that we have in each location, and we can confirm that we have 131 Veterans Affairs beds. Emily Ince. So, Mr. McCummer, are, are your numbers uh, more related to 2018, or do you have something more current? Because, again, there's that discrepancy. Oh, sorry, Mr. McCumber. Mr. McCumber. Yeah, sorry. 
My numbers were based at looking at the 2018 report that show, and, and I was only speaking on behalf of seven of those of these units, uh, and I, as I said, I excluded uh, uh, Camp Hill and I excluded Northumberland because I, I wasn't able to get that, you know, that information. But if you go to the 2018, and I don't think any of those had changed, is Soldiers Memorial Hospital, I, I stand to be corrected, was showing 25 contract beds, Fisherman's Memorial 23, Tyne Mara 31, Harborview 20, Veterans Place 15, St. Anne's 5, St. Martha's Regional had five contract beds. I understand they had those no longer. If you add those figures up, uh, it would be 124 beds based on that 2018 figure. In contacting the, the facilities to, to see how many veterans were in there, Soldiers Memorial, and I stand to be corrected as well, was showing four, Fisherman's four, Tynamara four, Harborview Hospital four, Veterans Place five, St. Anne's one, St. Martha's zero, so I was coming up with 22 veterans that were housed in those units. Now, I certainly stand to be corrected on, on the, the present figures that I have for those seven facilities. And it was just to give some idea to show the decline that we have in veterans being in those units presently that qualify under the, the present guidelines of Second World War War and Korean War um, accommodation. Right. MLA Ince with five minutes and 20 seconds. I'm good. Yeah. MLA Jessam with five minutes and 18 seconds. To, through the chair to our team uh, from Veterans Affairs Canada, probably a question that you get uh, regularly. You might know where my head's going with this, but um, preferred access is limited to uh, Second World War and Korean veterans. Uh, what is the discussion or is there an inclination for Veterans Affairs to open the doors to um, veterans that have been involved and served in more modern conflicts? And I won't be rigid about specific conflicts. I, I just, generally speaking, we have present day veterans serving in present and recent past conflicts and I'm just curious to hear from Veterans Affairs about an appetite or not uh, to include uh, veterans of other conflicts uh, in, in the term uh, preferred access through the chair. Mr. Harris. And thanks very much for the question. Uh, you know, we are looking at it. For all the reasons that have been raised here by our partners who are presenting, Mr. McCumber, there's been a significant change in the demographics of, uh, of Nova Scotia veterans, Canadian <laughs> veterans who are eligible for contract beds. Uh, you know, the limitation of World War II service and or Korea service uh, suggests that those individuals are quite aged and many are lost, unfortunately, have, have passed at this point in time. And so, you know, the, uh, the demographic shift in terms of the veteran population for Nova Scotia and more broadly across Canada means that we need to re-examine uh, the rules and eligibility and policy that's in place. We are looking at that. A, a colleague uh, of mine in the, in the department is looking at uh, the rules for long-term care that exist across the country and how best to approach this to ensure a couple of things. One is priority for ensuring that we're pro providing the, the top level of care for our veterans. Uh, no matter of their service, how do we make sure that they uh, have access to the best health care, be that for long-term care or any number of other uh, resources that they might need, physical, mental health. The second part of it is recognizing the critical nature of long-term care across the country, of course here in Nova Scotia as well. How do we ensure maximization of any beds that might exist from a Veterans Affairs point of view to ensure that the community can use them where veterans are not able to for reasons of lack of uh, demand because there aren't anybody who qualifies in those areas? Uh, or location, geographic location, things of that nature. We're, we're looking to ensure that we can help work with our provincial partners, in this case Nova Scotia, to use long-term care facilities to their absolute maximum. And, and holding a bed 
for a population that is declined or not in, uh, in demand at this point in time doesn't make any sense if it can be used better in a different uh, way. So this is the preferred admission uh, opportunity that exists as well to ensure that we can get veterans into uh, long-term care appropriately who may not qualify for some of the other uh, beds, the work that's underway at, uh, at Camp Hill and at other vet former veterans hospitals across the country. Uh, but we are looking at that from a, a policy perspective and a long-term perspective of how do we best work with each province? How do we work nationally to ensure that support for veterans? Uh, it's work that's underway. It's just not quite finished yet. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, with a minute and 52 seconds, Emily Jessen. So is it a possibility that we could move away from preferred access beds to a more, I'll say, preferred access scenario? Um, to the chair. Mr. Harris. It's a little bit too soon, unfortunately, Chair, to, to pronounce on where we're going, but we are looking at all the options. Uh, we've put in place a Veterans Affairs, uh, a Veterans Independence Program to help support healthy well-being for veterans in their home. It's been in place for a number of years. We've made modifications to that as well to ensure that intermediate care can ensure that veterans uh, can stay in their home for as long as possible. That's the best outcome for well-being, not a long-term care facility, is being at home. So we've put in uh, place measures for that to help avoid and minimize the demand on, on long-term care and help support healthy outcomes. So we're looking at all the options uh, with respect to uh, long-term care and where we go uh, in terms of the future. Emily Jessen. I think we'll, we'll move on to the NDP through the chair, if that's okay. Okay. We will uh, begin with the NDP, 20 minutes. Uh, MLA Burrell. Oh, thank you. Um, you, know, you. You all live so much in the world of these numbers that it's uh, probably hard for you to realize uh, People getting this for the first time might not get it on the first pass. Uh, so I, I'm thinking about um, the situation of a veteran who is uh, looking at needing to go into long-term care and lives in a rural area. Um, we're not near Camp Hill. Um, and there aren't handy contract beds. Um, if that veteran makes the decision to go into his community nearby uh, uh, nursing home. Uh, I wonder if, if, uh, if you could say a few things about what are the financial consequences uh, for that veteran and that family of that decision? If you could just characterize that. Mr. Harris. And I'll ask uh, Ms. McCloskey to add on, just from the point of view of uh, a veteran's decision as to whether or not they wish to go to yeah. something like Camp Hill or not. We have both of those circumstances. We have, we have veterans who live in rural uh, areas who decide they would like to be in Camp Hill for some of the reasons that were notif notif no uh, sorry, noted earlier yeah. around wanting to be in that kind of veteran cool. environment. And so we have people who live rurally whose families are actually local to Halifax who want to come in, mm -hmm. and we have people who live in rural situations who want to stay there. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask uh, Ms. McCloskey to talk about sort of uh, what, what comes from that. Ms. McCloskey. Thank you. Um, so if a veteran wants to be cared in a community facility close to their family and friends, they absolutely have the uh, opportunity to do that. The placement into those beds would be through the Nova Scotia uh, Seniors and Long-Term Care Department, but Veterans Affairs Canada will pay for the full cost of care of those veterans if they meet the eligibility criteria. And as in uh, contract beds, they would also have a maximum contribution for their accommodation and meals of $1,221 per month. Uh, if uh, they need long-term care for an illness or injury that's not related to service. If it's in relation to their service, then they would pay zero towards the accommodation and meals. Veterans Affairs would pay that on their behalf. And if they cannot, uh, through a means test, contribute the full 1,221, then we would do an income assessment to see what portion of that would be reasonable to expect the veteran to contribute. Emily Burrell. Um, so then, are you saying that there would be no financial impact of that decision for that veteran, uh, or and and no um, uh, uh, difference in VAC funded service levels if they went into into the community uh, uh, facility that uh, was did not have contract beds? Uh, the, the, it's neither here nor there from a money point of view? Is, Mi, I'm sorry, Ms. McCloskey. That is correct. Uh, the difference may be that he 
uh, the veteran would wait for placement through the provincial placement agency uh, via their regulations or rules to place provincial residents into community facilities. MLA Borough. Well, that is a consideration. That, that, so that it's not, it wouldn't be financial, it wouldn't be in the service provided, but the readiness of access would be outside of VAC and subject to the provincial wait list. That would be, that, that's the critical difference then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a gentle reminder. Wait till I recognize that. Uh, Ms. McCloskey. Uh, so yes, that is correct. There would be, uh, they would be placed through the provincial placement agency. So Veterans Affairs Canada would not be the one to determine who gets the next available bed at that facility. Emily Burrow. Well, thank you. Well, then, Mr. McCumber, think, thinking about this, um, we know that uh, when the time comes uh, that the long-term care decision is being made by veterans, that, uh, uh, that there are a lot of people who want to stay in their own communities. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm thinking about the conversations that you have and that are going on uh, uh, through the, the service officers of the, of the command. Uh, what are you hearing about, uh, from veterans about uh, uh, access to long-term care and what they'd like to see in terms of improvements possibly closer to home. Is this a conversation? Mr. McCumber. So it is a definite conversation with, with uh, many. Um, I know in uh, Chester um, there were 15 veterans that were polled there that, uh, and they were asked that, that, that question. Uh, where, where would you like to go if you, if you needed long-term care? And uh, they, they all agreed that they would like to stay in their homes as long as possible. However, if the need arose, they would like to go to uh, Fisherman's Memorial as part of the, the veterans unit. And, and I think we have to look at, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, veterans, as I see in Yarmouth anyway, there's a lot of comradeship there when they go there. They, they feel comfortable. Uh, and, and living in accommodation to be able to, as, as the reason for legions that were, were established many, many years ago, was because they came back from war and they had experienced the same, um, same uh, they all had the same experiences over there and they would come back, they could share that. And so they're looking for that type of, of a facility where they feel safe and, and, and we as legionnaires uh, we welcome those those veteran units within the communities. That's that's what keeps us us going. We advocate for those veterans to be able to to go to those facilities and and uh, meet with them and have coffee and and uh, and assist them. So so they do. They are saying they want to go there. My my concern with it with the you know with the with the preferred access would would be that we if a person comes along and 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 wants to, to be established or uh, housed in a, in a long-term care facility, that we're saying to them, yes, there is an opening, but the opening is in Camp Hill. So we're expecting you at 90 years old to, to get in, to pack up your bags and, and go to Camp Hill and take one of those uh, beds there. Uh, that's very, very unfair to, to ask a veteran of that. that. That's why the need for those preferred beds and, and all of the units that we have to ensure that they, they remain, you know, in those facilities. But sorry, long way around. But, but no, they, they are. They want to go to those facilities. MLA Burrell. So then, to come back to it from VAC's point of view, then, um, are there any? modifications to the present protocols that are being considered that might uh, address this kind of situation? Uh, or, for example, that might uh, find ways of bringing the VAC wait list to bear on more community uh, facilities? Is this something that's at all in view? Mr. Harris. Uh, a couple of things, and, and Mr. McCumber notes the, the Legion's advocacy in this particular area, both at, in the, the regional area, but also I know in speaking with his uh, demand com command 
Dominion Command uh, Central uh, group, he, they're very keen on, on seeing changes to long-term care. I, I think with respect to the answer they gave earlier, Mr. Chair, we are looking at what changes might be most effective in this case. And as we have discussed, you know, there are uh, circumstances uh, of individual veterans whereby they want to stay local. There are circumstances where they prefer to go somewhere else. There are circumstances where their family needs and supports require them to go somewhere else as well. And so we're trying to balance all of uh, the issues here. As I noted in my opening remarks, uh, I think we have uh, agreements with 700 community facilities across the country for uh, a group of just over 2,000 veterans. It's a, it's a heavy lift on our part to make sure that we can have as many community uh, organization agreements in place. Uh, we continue to do that across the country. We'll continue to do that in Nova Scotia, and, and we'll look at it as part of the overall uh, review of, of what aging in place looks like for veterans uh, in Canada. Emily Burrell. Well, I suppose VAC would recognize, too, that in a province like ours, this is particularly significant where uh, we have a, a, a larger rural percentage of our population and our older population and our wartime uh, formed population uh, uh, tends to be uh, more, rural, more rural again. Uh, uh, so it would seem natural that this would be a priority for the department's upcoming period. Yeah. Mr. Harris. We're trying to look at, you know, sort of the urban-rural splits that exist in, uh, in provinces across the country. I understand that. Uh, I'm, I'm coming uh, to you today from Prince Edward Island where we have similar kinds of setups, similar challenges that exist with our health care authorities uh, in terms of maintaining uh, sufficient supports and, uh, and, and local community facilities in, in all areas. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge that's certainly recognized from the Veterans Affairs perspective, and I understand a, a challenge that's being faced nationally in some places, as you know, uh, uh, through the chair, uh, more specifically, uh, you know, where there are rural uh, challenges and, and aging populations in those areas. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Emily Burrow. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, you're from VAC as, as well, about the situation of veteran spouses. Um, the, uh, as things stand at, with present policy, does, does VAC become involved with a percentage of costs in long-term care for veteran spouses? Ms. McCloskey? Uh, Veterans Health Care Regulations, which is the authority for the long-term care program, does not have any provisions for spouses of veterans. Emily Burrow that it hadn't, and I had hoped that it changed, but that is still the case. Um, uh, do, uh, um, perhaps I'll, I'll ask you, Mr. McCumber, does, do, does the Legion see this as something that would be uh, an important change, that there would be VAC support in long-term care uh, for uh, uh, veteran spouses? Well, Mr. So, sorry, uh, <laughs> Mr. McCumber. That change to see uh, in facilities, um, you know, the, the method of having the uh, arrangements made to have the veteran located there and, and certainly an opportunity to have their spouses there with them so that they wouldn't be separated, especially if they have to go to other facilities. Emily Burrell. I was wondering, Ms. White, if I could ask if, uh, is, is this uh, an alive conversation in the, in the uh, family groups that you relate to in your work, the, uh, uh, the, the need for uh, support for veteran spouses in, in nursing home facilities? Mr. McCumber. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Ms. White. So from a Camp Hill perspective, we now have 108 uh, veteran designated beds and we have 67 uh, Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care licensed beds. So that has opened up a whole new world of opportunity for spousal reunification. So now what occurs is if there is a veteran in our facility whose spouse requires or wishes to come into long-term care, they apply through the Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care process and they uh, are given priority placement uh, as per their policy. Um, as that's part of the life reunification of life partners and long-term care act. So that 
that does apply and they are placed. So, and currently we're happy to say we have eight couples living as uh, sp spouses that have been reunited uh, at Camp Hill currently. Emily Burrell, I believe Mr. Harris wanted to chime in on Please. that. You, okay, Mr. Harris. I'd, I'd just like to add, because we have certain circumstances whereby, of course, the spouse wants to come and stay with the veteran. We've also had certain circumstances where, unfortunately, after coming to stay with the veteran in a veteran's center, the veteran dies. And the spouse feels awfully uncomfortable there sometimes. And so the close camaraderie that exists by reunific reunification or, or unifying the spouse with the veteran can sometimes be short-lived, unfortunately. And then that requires another placement. That could be very difficult for the families as well. Uh, so it's another consideration I just offered as a, as a point of reflection for everyone that, you know, sometimes in, in unifying uh, families and couples, uh, we can create downstream effects in that we always want to be supportive. I think that we would all recognize that, you know, having long-standing couples together uh, in a long-term care facility is, is a, a noble goal. Uh, it's just that sometimes at the end of that, it can create some more complexity too for the health authority, for the family and others as well. I just wanted to note that. Emily Burrell with about five minutes and 50 seconds. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, am I understanding right that uh, the wait lists you're working with though, if you're working with a couple, are not the same? That the veteran themselves comes to you through the VAC wait list, but the veteran's spouse would come to you through that much longer wait list of the of the province. Uh, does this cause any difficulties? Ms. White. You're correct. We would have veterans come through the VAC waitlist process and then provincial residents, uh, including spouses, would come through the Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care placement process. But that placement process does have a priority provision for the placement of spouses. So. MLA Burrow. And can you say a little bit about what the priority placement means? Uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, an extra d dimension of getting you higher on the list? or Ms. White. I would defer to my colleagues at Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care because we take our direction from them. They prioritize and, and place it, but I do know that it is a consideration. Yeah. MLA Burrow. Well, thank you all very much for those answers. That, those are the things I wanted to ask, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, we will now move on to the uh, PC caucus. Uh, we get our 20 minutes, beginning with, I believe, MLA Taggart. MLA Taggart. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, as I began, uh, my, my, uh, a lot of questions have been answered, of course. Um, some of my are, mine are directed towards Veterans Affairs. Uh, but if you don't mind, before I start, I just really want to thank uh, Mr. McCumber for his service as well as the work that he does on behalf of the veterans and the Legion members in Nova Scotia. So I thank you very much for that, sir. Um, and, and like I say, a lot of these questions have been asked or partly answered or whatever, so if I kind of go over them. Uh, but so we know, and quite honestly, it is very confusing. There's a lot of different levels and, and uh, you know, uh, bureaucracies and rules and that to follow, and it's a, it's a challenge for many, I'm sure, because it's a challenge for us here today, or certainly for me, sometimes to follow uh, what's, what's what. But So we know that Veterans Waitlist is managed by Veterans Affairs Canada, and Nova Scotia Health receives those that are placed in Camp Hill. And how many are on the Camp Hill wait list? And I, I, I believe there's been a reduction, like long-term care took over some of those, I think. But how many are, is there people currently on a wait list for Camp Hill? <coughs> Ms. McCloskey. There are currently 20 veterans awaiting placement under the preferred admission initiative at Camp Hill. So those would be veterans that were not entitled to access the facility under a contract bed. So they would be veterans that served post-war time or served with allied, for, served allied forces, and in some events, some that served in Canada only. So those are the eligibility that uh, the Preferred Admission Initiative opened up at Camp Hill. So there's 20 on that list, but there are no war service veterans awaiting placement to a contract bed. Emily Taggart. Oh, again, confusion. 
But uh, so when I think of Camp Hill, I think of, uh, and, and trust me on this, I, I, I support the fact, very much support the fact, that we're starting to in some ways recognize those that didn't serve in World War II or Korea. But, but in specific to the rules that we have today, um, the, those that are in Camp Hill, those 24, I think you said, that are waiting in Camp Hill are veterans, but not veterans that meet the uh, historic requirements. Am I right about that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we know uh, what makes someone eligible for a contract bid, but would you, is, is that, is that, uh, uh, well, I will refer to them as World War II, well, World War II and Korean veterans or current veterans. Um, contract bids are, are for World War II or? Ms. McCluskey. So contract beds are designated for war veterans only. So you must have served during the Second World War or the Korean War before they arrived at Armistice. So anybody who served in Korea prior to July 27, 1953, and those who served during the Second World War, most would be entitled to uh, priority access to a contract bed. Emily Taggart. Thank you. Um I think you've pretty much, uh, pretty much uh, answered my questions. Before I hand off to my colleague, uh, um, Emily from uh, Chester St. Margaret's, I, I just want to say, that I, I kinda, I, I'm sure I'm repeating myself, but you know, this is an, a really great discussion. And uh, um, I hope, um, you know, I, I think there's lots we, not lots, but there's more we can do for our veterans. And I think, you know, um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's really up to you folks that are before us today to sort that out. And uh, I look forward to you doing that. Thank you. Thank you, MLA Taggart. We'll move on to MLA Barcos. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all for what you do, but Mr. McComber, thank you for your service. I come from a long line, my father's, my father, father, father's father, my brother. Um, my, with that being said, my first question is um, to Veterans Affairs. Um, and, I'm, and then I'm going to ask Mr. McComber the same question. And, um, how do you expect long term, yeah, how do you expect long term care needs of veterans to evolve in the, for the next generation? Like, what do you see? Mr. Harris. I think it's fair to say when we look at the, the population health of, uh, of veterans, you know, the, the most recent census indicated 461,000 veterans, uh, which is a great number for us to have. Uh, we were sort of estimating it for a number of years, but in the last census, veterans were included as an identifier. Uh, we serve, uh, you know, on a regular basis, veterans, we also serve family members and RCMP members as well. Uh, and we serve those in, in different ways. Some require uh, supports from a treatment benefit point of view. In other words, access to physiotherapies, medicines, treatment, uh, mental health treatment. <clears throat> and so when we look at the veteran population, what we see is a, a population that tends to be uh, less well on the whole than Canadians. They suffer more mental health issues. They suffer more issues of physical health as a, resu as a result of their service. If you just think of it as uh, you know, the, the difficulty of, uh, of serving, uh, the wear and tear on, on knees and shoulders and, and amongst the other uh, injuries that might be suffered. So they tend to have uh, a health uh, that is uh, not as good as the, as the rest of, of their Canadian counterparts of the same age. So we need to make sure that we are in early days treating them making sure that we're mitigating their injuries and projecting forward to understand what other issues they may have and arise. Earlier I mentioned a Veterans, Affair, a Veterans Independence Program uh, that's been around since the 70s that provides that kind of in-home support for those individuals who might need it, who have a, a, an illness or an injury related to their service that might require some extra in-home health. That could be a home adaptation, you know, making uh, something more accessible. It could be somebody coming in and doing housekeeping and groundskeeping for periods of time where a veteran's not able to do those kinds of things. Uh, so when we look at the, uh, the long-term status for health, we're trying to do two things. One is manage the health requirements of veterans on a long-term basis. 
but also avoidance and prevention. Working with our Canadian Armed Forces colleagues to help minimize the injuries and illnesses that might be suffered during service at the outset to avoid illness or injury. So there's preventative measures that we're working on with our Canadian Forces colleagues. And then as soon as we identify injuries on behalf of, uh, of veterans, working with them to address them, to mitigate and minimize the impacts that they may have going forward. But we do recognize that they have a, a health that is probably uh, not as good as their, uh, their Canadian citizen counterparts. And we need to make sure that we're intervening uh, to ensure their health on a long-term basis as well. Emilia Barcos. I'd like to ask the same question to Mr. McCumber. If you'd like, I can repeat it. Uh, Mr. McCumber. Thank you. Um, I guess when we look to the, the future, I guess this is, this is my, my feeling anyway. We look back, you know, those that went to war during the First World War, Second World War, Korean War. Many soldiers went to war from the same communities. You know, you, little some little community, they, there may have been 30, 40, 50 uh, members of that community that, that went and fought. When they came back, they came back to a hero's welcome. You know, there was thousands in the street, there was hundreds and thousands on the, the dockyards, and they were, they were treated like heroes. They were welcomed back to Canada. What I'm seeing now is that you have individuals going. You have an individual, maybe one individual from a community that goes to Afghanistan, uh, fights the battle, represents his country, and then when he comes back home, he walks down the street of his hometown, not to a hero's welcome, nobody to associate with, can't, you know, not really knowing where to go or whatever. So I really see that need down the road for these long-term care facilities when they need that. They need to know that we are here for them, that we are going to provide for them in the long term and that they have a facility that they can go to, that we can treat many of them with PTSD or some of the, the uh, effects that they've had from serving in some of these uh, war-torn countries. So uh, down the road, uh, as I said, I, I think we need to, be, we need to rethink uh, the needs of, of, of these veterans that, that we have. Uh, I, I, I totally support them being into a, a facility that there's some commonality there. So I guess that's just my, my response to that. Emily Barcos. Thank you, Chair. So um, Veterans Affairs earlier, I think um, one of the MLAs across the room asked about um, if you're um, looking over uh, the qualifications and whatnots, and I, I think if I'm not, if I'm correct, Mr. Harris, that you had said that you're reviewing, um, or work is underway, or something like that. Um, I'm just asking, where at in the process is it, and how long do you see that? How long do you see this taking for before the decision is made at whether or not the rules will be changed? Mr. Harris, I'll start, uh, Mr. Chair, by offering. It's a very complex issue. <clears throat> uh, it's a complex issue because it not only involves Veterans Affairs, our determinations around what priority status, what eligibility and entitlement might be in place, but negotiations with 10 provinces and three territories. Uh, we also work with uh, our Indigenous colleagues and others around uh, placements for, uh, for, for facilities for Indigenous veterans too. And so that's work that's underway. Uh, all of the agreements that we have at the moment are all somewhat unique and different and they all require changes, and, and each of our uh, provincial counterparts has a different approach for long-term care. Sometimes they're in the process of changing it right at this very moment in time as well, uh, regrouping health authorities and things of that nature. Uh, so we have twofold work to do. One is the, the consultation that it must exist with our provincial counterparts because ultimately they are delivering health care through long-term care facilities and other uh, health care initiatives. And secondly, the work that we need to do to make sure that uh, we're serving the veteran population in the very best possible way. Um, we started that work on making sure that we can look at what the entitlement and eligibility is, and we continue to discuss with our provincial colleagues. And ultimately, that may end up at a, a federal ministers of health, a federal provincial ministers of health discussion and others around what is the right 
outcome uh, for how all provinces can support long-term care delivery for our veteran population, working with the, with the federal department responsible in Veterans Affairs Canada. In terms of uh, a time frame, I can't really give you a time frame. Um, I'd say, you know, we're, we're probably a year out uh, from coming to something that's uh, fully able to be consulted and other uh, supports along that way. So it, it will take some time still, which is why we've made some modifications around things like the preferred admission approach to ensure that we could use available beds, to ensure that those veterans who need access to long-term care can get it in various places. So we've made some small interim adjustments uh, to try and recognize the fact that there may be gaps in areas, uh, both provincially and otherwise, and we're working on trying to correct all of those things at once. Emily Berkos. Thank you. I had to ask, you know. Um, so, but you had said best care, which then leads me to asking uh, Nova Scotia Health, um, what measures are in place to ensure high quality care for, for our veterans um, in long-term care facilities? And this could go to either or within the Department of Nova Scotia Health. Ms. White. So uh, from a Camp Hill perspective, I can say that we, uh, we do follow the Accreditation Canada uh, guidelines for long-term care, uh, and they set out the standards of excellence. Uh, we also follow all of the Department of Seniors and long-term care facility uh, requirements. Um, so those are are kind of two benchmarks. We also are rolling out um, provincially uh, into Rye um, data through Chi High that will allow us to look at our, our uh, performance metrics and, and how they compare against other facilities provincially as well as nationally. So we've been doing that at Camp Hill for some time, but we're thrilled now that the province uh, across all different long-term care facilities will be also rolling that out because uh, that creates, creates great benchmarks and, uh, and performance metrics for us. Thank you. MLA Barcos. And I think I remember um, in a, a previous Veterans Affair, we talked a little bit about Kai High, and that is a... So thank you. I will be passing um, the rest of the time on to MLA Harris with a ask of how, how much time do we have left. Um, MLA Harrison with five minutes and 25 seconds. And all my questions have been answered, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I would like to make a comment, though, uh, just, just in listening to, uh, to all of you about maybe expanding the eligibility for those that are serving now. And, and, and you're right, they come back physically hurt and mentally hit, emotionally hurt in all kinds of ways. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that the discussion is taking place to, to expand that eligibility because it's really needed. I always walk away from this committee feeling good because I know you people care and you're gonna do what you can do in, in order to help. So uh, I would just wanna encourage you in, to continue that work and, and I hope that uh, it will expand as time goes on. So thank you very much. Um, MLA Boudreau with four minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to everybody for, for coming today. And certainly, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not typically on this committee, but, but it is a very interesting um, topic, right? I'm a, my wife and I are both healthcare providers. Uh, and um, prior to moving to Nova Scotia, I lived in Petawawa and it was during uh, the Afghan war. And um, I never really had a whole lot of experience in terms of you know, living through wartime or to, you know, my grandfather was a, a vet and talked lots about kind of his experiences, but, but it did really open my eyes in terms of the challenges and, the, and, and you talk about the, the, you know, those going uh, uh, you know, overseas, but also the families left behind. And, and we got to meet a lot of those families and, and understanding they were in such a different place than I was at, at the same age. And so, you know, the conversations about spousal uh, having supports and, and being able to be uh, reunited with, with their loved ones certainly, you know, rings home. And, um, and so uh, thank, you. thank you for the kind of that kind of discussion. I do want to talk a little bit, um, and maybe to NSH, I'm going to ask a, a, my first question. And, and our province has invested significantly in terms of uh, long-term care and, and certainly investments with um, whether it's CCAs or RNs or LPNs in terms of uh, free tuition, additional seats, seats and wage increases. And um, I, guess, I guess my, my question is, has there been, you know, I guess 
and maybe Camp Hill, you, you can answer some of that too. With, with these kind of significant um, investments, have we been able to ensure that there's sufficient staffing at facilities for, for our veterans, like in, in Camp Hill? So, We'll go to Ms. White first. Ms. White. Sure. So certainly recruitment and retention of staff is, a, is an ongoing uh, challenge for us, but there's no question that the variety of different initiatives that have been uh, put in place, uh, anything that's kind of supporting overall the sector, both the long-term care sector as well as an acute, is helping uh, us to attract, recruit, and retain uh, staff. And, uh, and I think we also are very fortunate to have a number of staff who for whom caring for veterans or caring for individuals, older adults in a long-term care facility holds special meaning. And, and so we do work to create that community as well. And I think that does help to recruit and retain staff as well. So. Mr. McDougall? Be a bit more specific to your question though. Um, certainly in conversations with our leaders within uh, uh, care settings that care for veterans. Uh, there's been a story shared in relation to the uh, funding that's been made available to the CCAs uh, and the importance of being able to build that base up of those providers. Um, also, uh, within the last two years of the additional um, uh, uh, retention uh, funding that's been provided to the nursing uh, profession, uh, that's helped us to uh, both recruit and to also retain uh, nurses who maybe were thinking about retiring. And so uh, allowing them to continue to, to share their care expertise and caring for um, you know, all of our patients, but most certainly the veterans uh, who so well deserve. Um, and, I, and I think that helps to build that, uh, that base of, uh, and team so that it, it will hopefully allow some of the other measures that are put in place, such as exploring international nurses to Nova Scotia, looking at this, the additional seats that have been added into our educational institutions over the last um, eight, eight years. And so we will be starting to see those uh, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, those resources coming into the system to help, again, support uh, long-term care and other care within Nova Scotia Health and across other, other departments within the province. So uh, I would say yes to your question that it's been very beneficial. 20 seconds, MLA Boudreau. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hold there and I, I have another question or two after, but maybe it'll get asked, who knows, right? So, thank you. Okay, we will now move on to uh, our second round of questioning. Each caucus will have nine minutes and 30 seconds uh, in this, this round. So, MLA Jessam for the Liberal Caucus. <coughs> Goodness, excuse me. Uh, thank you, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, reference a, a conversation I had yesterday with uh, um, <coughs> Goodness. Um, reference a conversation I had yesterday with an individual from Cape Breton who um, wanted me to acknowledge that Nova Scotia, uh, when compared when compared to other jurisdictions in Canada, is home to uh, the most significant uh, population of of serving. Uh, military men and women, and uh, express the the likelihood in many cases, or the, the reality and the likelihood for future uh, situations whereby those that serve find themselves retiring here in Nova Scotia, and um, therefore it is our responsibility to to ensure that they have a landing pad if and when uh, long-term care becomes um, a facility becomes uh, part of their their care package um, down the road. Um, what I'm what I haven't heard. I'm I'm, I'm basing this on the conversation today. Uh, there is, and t this is back to um, Mr. McCumber's uh, acknowledgement that there is there is a policy that. Nova Scotia Health can move um, individuals from the civilian population into a, a long-term care placement as part of, like that would that would have otherwise been designated as a as a contract bed, but I'm not hearing that there is a reciprocal agreement 
uh, at seniors in long-term care to ensure that if there is uh, a need for a veteran, at least for a, um, I guess a preferred access veteran, um, is, is, that, is that something that the department can comment on as to whether or not they're open to a commitment to establish on a go forward basis? Mr. McDougall. In relation to Nova Scotia Health? Or, okay. So I, I would say that the Department of Seniors Long Term Care is, is separate from Nova Scotia Health and that we would take um, in, instruction uh, based on them being funders and related to the policies and procedures that we have to follow. Um, so I, I think that would be something I'd have to defer to seniors in long term care for further consultation with them. MLA Jessam. Thank you, through the chair. Um, we heard that there is a priority placement <coughs> policy related to reunification for uh, families and I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if it's not something that uh, Nova Scotia Health can comment on today. I'm, through the chair, would ask that um, Nova Scotia Health provides the committee with a response as to whether or not there is an appetite to establish a preferred placement policy to ensure that if a contract bed is filled and there are no placements for a veteran, an eligible veteran. Um, is there a preferred access, is there an appetite for a preferred access policy? If that's less than clear, I'm happy to try to clarify, but um, I'll just leave it there for the, through the chair. So Mr. McDougall. So, um, I'll, maybe I'll try and restate uh, what happens. So as Veterans Affairs VAC patients, um, uh, as we have beds identified and we have a vacancy, um, we would inform Veterans Affairs Canada and, and they would work with the existing uh, demand in relation to vet Veterans Affairs, veterans who would uh, require access to our VAC beds. Patients who would not fall into that category Nova Scotia Health continuing care does an assessment and those patients would then fall to the placement policy within seniors and long-term care. And that's, and then seniors and long-term care would inform us of which patient would be next in relation to which patient we take into one of our, our existing beds. So it would be an ask to seniors and long-term care for a policy change in relation to the question that you ask, not so much us in Nova Scotia Health having the ability to create our own policy as it relates to how we have intake of veterans and or patients that are requiring another pathway through seniors and long-term care. Does that make sense? MLA Jessup. Thank you, through the chair. I, I, I appreciate the kind of the cross-departmental relationship that exists, but it's still it still stands out to me that there is a bit of an inequity in the policies as they exist. Um, you know, the, the, the contract beds are there with certainty to place a veteran. A bed is used for a civilian, but there is not a guarantee by policy um, whereby, you know, if, if if those contract beds are full, that there is a, a replacement, if you want to call it that, um, to ensure that a veteran has a place to be. So through the, through the chair, I'm wondering if, if Nova Scotia Health would, would connect with seniors in long-term care and provide the committee with a response as to whether or not that is something that they are prepared to agree to to ensure that there is that reciprocal agreement um, as part of ensuring that war heroes have a place to be when, when the time comes. So who from Nova Scotia Health would like to address that question? Uh, 
M oh, sorry, uh, Mr. McDougal. <clears throat> we can certainly bring forward your question to Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care, but we don't have the ability to give them direction. They actually give us direction. So, um, but we, we can bring that to them and inform them of that question that you asked. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Uh, MLA uh, Inns with two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, uh, can you t t tell us or talk to us about what might be, uh, what other provinces might be doing well to support veterans in long-term care that we could implement here or maybe we are already doing and doing better? I don't know. I'd like you to talk about that. Okay, Mr. Harris. And respectfully, I'd ask uh, Ms. McCluskey to answer the question. She's, she's got her pulse on, uh, on what's going on across the country. Ms. McCluskey with one minute and 24 seconds. Okay. I think many provinces are doing things well and they, they are all committed to serving veterans and doing so very well. They have different um, support systems as Mr. Harris alluded to previously. The agreements that we have across Canada for contract beds are numerous. They're in excess of 60 agreements uh, given us the directives that were established at the time that facilities were transferred from Veterans Affairs Canada to the provinces, and those transfers happened anywhere between the 1950s right up until 2016 when we transferred the last facility to uh, Quebec, which was St. Anne's Hospital. So each health authority that manages those facilities or, or the government that manages those facilities have different systems in place, but um, the preferred admission or the priority, priority admission of war veterans uh, is respected throughout Canada. Um, and the numbers, as we indicated, are, are declining significantly because of the advanced stage of the war veteran population. And we're in discussion with them as to how, how do we proceed and what happens into the future, which will be defined by the work that our policy colleagues uh, are doing. MLA Ince, that's all we have. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, um, MLA Burrell, nine minutes and 30 seconds. Well, well thank you. Um, I just wanted, to, Ms. White, to, to go back to the question that uh, Mr. Ince opened the meeting with. I, he was asking about the infrastructure disruptions of the last couple of weeks. Um, and you, uh, you explained that er everything is in hand, we're okay now. Uh, uh, but I wonder if you could uh, speak to uh, what were some of the uh, disruptions uh, in uh, service that uh, your resident population needed to deal with as a, as a result of the infrastructure problems of the last few weeks? Uh, that would be uh, Ms. White. Sure. So for the time period that uh, we did not have access to running water, uh, we did look at alternate ways to help support the care needs of the residents. Um, we did need to bring in uh, portable toilets for our staff, and, uh, and we did ask visitors to consider not visiting the facility at that, uh, at that point in time. Um, but we worked really closely with all of our colleagues in procurement, got lots of drinking water brought over, lots of additional supplies to allow us to ensure that we could meet all the, the care needs of residents. Uh, so it required lots of uh, lots of teamwork and uh, and pulling together, but uh, but people uh, did did do that really well. And uh, while our colleagues and facilities worked quickly to to make the repair happen, Emily Burrell. In that situation with the the portable toilets and the brought in water and so on, how how long were you in the in the throes of that? Ms. White? I'm trying to remember the exact amount of time, so that's why Eileen made Ms. Yeah. Ms. McGibbon. Thank you. So the first evening when we had the first, uh, first incident, I think it was six to eight hours before we had a restoration, as, as Ms. White uh, referenced, our facilities team responded very, very quickly. And so we had a, a resolution that evening, I think around 11 p.m., so we had been like six to seven hours where we were dealing with the uh, loss of running water, but then we had a second break that later that night, and that followed into what would have been Wednesday into Thursday. Um, 
in duration of time, and then another restoration, thankfully, was, was in place uh, into Thursday, Friday. So, um, and as, as Ms. White referenced, uh, the team was incredibly responsive, um, and so it was two periods of time not continuous within that three-day period. Emily Burrow? So when that kind of a disruption is experienced, is there um, uh, some kind of a contingency framework uh, in place that is kind of activated that you move to? Or uh, clearly this had never happened before. Is this a situation where uh, management really had to kind of invent a path? Ms. McGibbon. Um, yes, of course, we have um, contingencies in place for any kind of catastrophic event that might affect uh, our systems within healthcare. Uh, this was one, as you referenced, that was unusual to us. We had not, that was an, what was a new situation. However, um, as uh, we always see, we had an incredible response from our support teams uh, corporately within facilities as well as our clinical teams to to do everything they possibly could, as, as Heather outlined, to ensure that we were taking care of our patients and doing the absolute best we can whilst the work was underway to restore services back to our normal uh, status. Um, I think um, in, in terms of the second part of your question, do we have a structure in place? There's a pretty significant uh, infrastructure as it relates to emergency management and, em and emergency preparedness, and those folks are incredible uh, when an event happens at not only guiding and directing, but supporting the teams and ensuring that they're doing a, a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to support whatever is needed. Emily Burrell. Yes, well, uh, so I'm wondering, I, I guess really it's too early uh, to answer definitively uh, uh, the lessons learned from the adjustments that had to be made, but at, at this preliminary stage, are there, is there anything about the operation of Camp Hill from this recent experience that is kind of emerging clearly? Uh, here are some things we need to attend to in a way that is different than before. Ms. White? I, I, there isn't anything that stands out specific to Camp Hill. I mean, I think every opportunity, you know, whenever you experience an, uh, an event like this, you, you learn something new. Um, but certainly, I think, extremely proud of how many people stepped in and, and grateful for the support that Camp Hill um, received as part of a, a larger Halifax Infirmary campus, because we were one of three buildings impacted. And so we had uh, a tremendous amount of support um, and, and people who, who stepped in to help. Yeah. Emma, sorry, Ms. Gibbon? Ms. McGibbon. Just add that I think, as Heather pointed out, a, a lot of de debriefing post event uh, has been occurring to ensure that if there's anything that we need to maybe do, do differently the next time, if anything similar or related was to occur, that we use it as an opportunity to learn and, and to uh, improve as we go. Emily Burrow. Thank you. And just lastly, um, uh, the, uh, the flooding problems at the Abbey Lane, um, uh, as, as, how has that impacted uh, your facility? Uh, yeah, the Camp Hill. Yeah. Ms. White. So the flooding at the Abbey Lane um, has not impacted us at Camp Hill, no. MLA Burrow, with uh, what, for just over three minutes. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the, okay, MLA Boudreaux with nine minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you, Chair. And I just have um, one question, uh, more of a curious question than, than anything, and I'll direct it um, to Veterans Affairs Canada. So one of the things that has taken place in Nova Scotia is kind of our model of care uh, in long-term care facilities. Like, basically, we're dedicating and saying... Um, we modified it basically so it's 4.1 4 hours of care per bed. And just wondering in terms of Veterans Affairs Canada, in terms of kind of, you know, contracted beds and beds across Canada, do you have, where does your model lie in terms of uh, staffing? Ms. McCluskey. So what we uh, communicate to facility partners is that as long as the hours of care meet the standards in the province in which the care is being provided, that meets uh, the requirements of Veterans Affairs Canada. Emily Boudreau. Thank, thank you, Chair. And I'm going to um, I'm going to I'm going to pass it on. I think 
MLA Taggart is looking to, to uh, okay. take it over. Uh, MLA Taggart. Thank you. Uh, whoever wants to can answer this. I'm not sure the right person, but uh, uh, Mr. McCumber spoke about um, um, fully paid or somebody at least, uh, you know, whether it's a fully paid veterans uh, bid because, uh, you know, it's somehow related to their war in, or service in, in, injury and not. I guess the qu first part of the question is, that's all determined after they got the bed. They're still a veteran, so we're, we don't have a situation where uh, veterans waiting to see what the answer is. Am I right about that? And, and to follow up, what is that procedure? Uh, Ms. Bukowski. So the funding in facilities with contract beds, where we have contract beds available, are done typically through a budget. So we submit a budget to the facility for the anticipated cost for the following year, um, and we pay the full cost of care. The veteran's contribution to accommodation and meals, you're correct. Like, if they go into long-term care, the maximum they have to pay is 1,221, and if the application process is not completed, which typically it happens pretty quickly, uh, we would say admit the veteran, and then we will catch up on the paperwork to determine the amount thereafter. MLA Tiger. Thanks, and if I could, uh, just a personal comment I, I, I really want to make, uh, mostly to Mr. McCumber. Um, as I, I have a lot of friends, uh, and you can imagine not very many of them served in World War II or, or Korea, but uh, not that I'm not young either. But anyway, uh, um, and PTSD is a huge concern to me, and I believe that we missed that uh, for our veterans that came home from World War II at least, okay? And so I guess all I'm saying is as, as you go forward, keep your foot on the gas, because those folks are going to need, they're really going to need our support, uh, or your support. Thank you. Mr. McCumber. We are ad addressing those concerns at, at the branch level, where through our veterans outreach programs, we are offering uh, buddy check coffees where we are inviting um, members that have served uh, out to the branches to socialize. We're, we're putting on model building uh, programs for them. Um, we have a program where they can come in and, and learn how to, to tie flies and, uh, and then go to the Miramichi this summer and try them out. So we're offering uh, a lot of programs to, to, uh, to bring in those members that uh, are, you know, have the effects of PTSD and uh, trying to reunite them and get them together and focus on uh, some of the activities that we can uh, provide for them. MLA Taggart? Uh, MLA uh, Barcos, please. Okay. MLA Barcos, with about five minutes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you'll have to excuse me. I'm just going to, I have some notes here somewhere. Um, so I'm just wondering, can you explain um, the role of LTC facilities? Um, and VAC to confirm, to confirm funding for health care costs and accommodation fees, and how does that process work? And that is to whoever puts their hand up first. Okay. Sorry, Ms. McCossie. Okay, so just, I'm not sure I understood the question. Thank you for the question, but I'm not sure I understood it fully. Um, so Veterans Affairs Canada, there's funding, there's two types of funding for contract beds and also for veterans in community beds. So for veterans that are in contract beds, we have agreements with those facilities whereby we provide an annual budget for the expected cost of caring for the number of veterans that are within that facility. At the end of the fiscal year, we would do an um, operating cost review and then settle the accounts whether we owe the facility or they owe us. For veterans in community beds, the facilities bill Veterans Affairs Canada via our third party service provider, which is Medivy Blue Cross. So they would submit the cost of a, the daily cost of the bed to Veterans Affairs Canada for payment. Now, the second part of the funding is direct to the veterans. So each resident in Nova Scotia would have to contribute towards the cost of their accommodation and meals. 
So for veterans that are um, supported by Veterans Affairs Canada, through regulations, the maximum that they would need to pay, regardless of income or status, is $1,221 per month. All veterans would pay that unless they need long-term care as a result of an illness or injury related to service. If that's the case, they pay zero towards their accommodation and meals. Veterans Affairs Canada pays it all on their behalf. If a veteran is married and has exemptions for spousal and for personal support and has less than $1,221 left at the end of the month, he would only need to be contributing he would only need to contribute that portion that he has left. So it's a sliding scale from zero to 1221 based on income testing. Does that answer your question? MLA Barcos. Well, you, you might have thought you didn't understand it, but you kind of did. And so, that does, so does that go for community beds as well? Ms. McCluskey. Yeah. So community beds would be billed through Medivy Blue Cross. So Medivy, the facility would bill Medivy, Medivy Blue Cross for each day a veteran occupies a bed. And Veterans Affairs Canada, again, pays the full cost of care, even though the veteran is in a community bed. And the veteran would contribute, again, to their accommodation and meals according to the rules. Ms. Or MLA Barcos. Thank, thank you. Um, so, and this is for either VAC, but I think maybe more Nova Scotia Health, but I may be mistaken, so it might be part of the answer stating I'm wrong. Um, but um, do you encounter any challenges or um, common concerns during the placement of, uh, or the placement process related to veterans? Any? Just need a hand. Okay, Ms. <laughs> Ms. White? So certainly I can speak on behalf of Camp Hill and say it runs very smoothly together with Veterans Affairs Canada. So when we identify a vacancy, we reach out to them. They send along the information uh, for the next the veteran who will receive the bed. And, uh, and then we work quickly to facilitate uh, that admission. Yeah. Ms. McCluskey, would you like to add? clarify that the placement process, uh, other than working with the facilities on contract beds, Veterans Affairs Canada is not implicated. For the admission to community beds, it's fully done by the Nova Scotia Seniors and Long-Term Care. MLA Barcos with 45 seconds. Well, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, appreciate you. I know that there's no way I could get a question out and it'd be answered in uh, probably 30 seconds now. So I do appreciate it. And I do appreciate all your straightforward answers. And I appreciate Mr. McCumber for his service. I thank you. Okay. So thank you to all of our members for the, the questions. Uh, definitely lots to think about today and a lot to glean from this for sure. What I'd like to do is give all of our uh, witnesses and our guests a chance to uh, have cl closing statements. So we'll begin on, we'll go backwards this time, we'll begin with uh, Mr. McCumber to begin with the closing statement. Thank you. <clears throat> I guess just in closing, I'd like to say that over the last few years, we've seen the Embud come to the area. The Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs, we've seen the Associate Deputy Minister. We've had many town hall meetings. We've had a lot of veterans out, uh, members that are presently serving, those that have served. Issues are brought forward. That's it. I'll say no more. The, the, there's no response from the issues that are brought to, from these town hall meetings. I'd, I'd just like to say that uh, yeah. <laughs> The, it, it doesn't matter what we do today if we change, even if we, we come up with preferred access beds for these units that I've mentioned, uh, there's no openings. And looking down the road, if you look at Yarmouth with five veterans and 10 non-veterans, five years from now, we'll say we just lost uh, one veteran from there at 106 years old. We, ha we have another one that's over 100. Shortly down the road, we will have no veterans in those facilities. They are going to become community long-term care facilities. And that's very shortly. That's very shortly. And so 
what are we going to do? More resolutions that come from provincial command, the Dominion command, the VAC, you know, 20 years later, we're still doing the same thing. We, we have to take action now. And the solution that I thought was a simple one, a simple one, is simply to say, you know, the, the, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, who, who I understand responsibilities have been, been granted to them from Veterans Affairs, just change your thinking and your policy so that when you have a veteran that has served but doesn't come under the guidelines, that's up in a hallway in a hospital for four weeks on a bed in a hallway with everybody walking by every day and all night, that's not fair. That is not fair. Now, there's no room for that individual to put him into a place in, in some of these facilities. There's no room, but when a place comes open, when one of those placements comes open f from a, 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 a non-veteran, for Pete's sake, let's put them there. That's the simple solution. We can do that. That, that veteran that is there, treat them as a citizen, if you want, of the community. You don't have to call him veteran, uh, but he is a veteran. And he's going to come, if he's placed there, he's going to come under the guidelines of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, not Veterans Affairs. And if we get those people in there now and moving them there, then you know something, we'll, we're going to gradually build those veterans into those units and maybe within five or six years or seven years, we'll have agreements in place that maybe those veterans that are there will be looked after by Veterans Affairs. We need to move and we need to move now and we need the support of, of the departments. We need the support of, of all of the parties here within this province to recognize the need We, we, we need to assist, you know, all of our veterans. And, and I, I just feel that the, the solution there is to, uh, to proceed as, as we say. We, we, we know that we would like to have preferred admission beds down the road. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the next day. It's going to take time. And the more time we take, the less veterans we're going to have in these units, and we need to look after them. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCumber. Uh, from Nova Scotia Health, would there be a closing statement? Mr. McDougall. I do want to thank the committee uh, for the invite today. I appreciate the ability to come and speak, and I certainly want to acknowledge Mr. McCumber and your service and uh, all the work that uh, the, the, Royal, um, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion supports veterans, uh, supports our teams and, and the facilities that they work in. Um, just, just did want to clarify one more time before we, we close that uh, as Nova Scotia Health Authority, we work with Veterans Affairs Canada and Seniors in Long-Term Care who sets the policies and guidelines in which we operate. So we do not, in fact, have the authority to change any of those policies, procedures or guidelines. We are, we are the operators and we work with the funders, Veterans Affairs Canada, seniors in long-term care, to ensure that the patients receive care where they can, when they can, given the, the, given the guidelines and the policies and procedures were provided. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. McDougall, and thank you, Mr. McGibbon and Ms. White as well. Uh, Mr. Harris. Just quickly, I'd say thanks very much for the opportunity to come and present at this committee. Uh, very uh, good discussion here today. And, and the last piece that I would just add is, Mr. McCumber, we do actually hear you. We, we, we know the recommendations you're making. We know the areas that we need to work on, and we are working on them. And, and I commit to you that we are working to resolve this issue, not only from a long-term care perspective, but other needs that exist for veterans as well. And, uh, and we'll still continue to work with you at the local level in the Legion, at the national level of the Legion as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris, and thank you, Ms. McCloskey, for your, all your contributions today. Uh, so that uh, ends our time together as a committee and with our witnesses. So we will now take, uh, I'll say, a uh, three-minute recess. To uh, We have to attend to some committee business to allow our guests to leave. And again, thank you very much for coming. We stand in recess.
Okay, order. I call our meeting back to order. We'll uh, just move on to our committee business uh, for any discussion that's here around uh, some letters and some correspondence sent back to our clerk from our, response, or our question about uh, other jurisdictions and their handling of Veterans Affairs. We received uh, correspondence from Northwest Territories, Newfoundland Labrador, Prince Edward Island had responded. Uh, so Yukon is the only province that has not responded at this point. Is there any discussion there? Okay, acknowledge we received it. And then the other uh, piece of uh, correspondence was from uh, Ms. Heather White, Director of Veteran Services and Geriatrics at Camp Hill. She had responded to a request for statistics on the number of deaths at Camp Hill between 20, 20, 2020 and 2023. Any discussion on that letter? Okay. Is there any other business? Emily Jessen. Uh, just two, two hopefully quick things. Uh, firstly, through the chair, uh, would the committee clerk be able to compile a list of the witnesses that have appeared before this committee dating back to 2020? It's kind of an arbitrary date, but it overlaps the former and the, the new government, so I want to be uh, thorough and, and fair to both, uh, both uh, the committee members and the clerk. Sure, so I'm, I'm too... sure the, com the clerk can, can compile that list and uh, make it available to all caucuses. Please and thank you. And, and secondly, the, the representatives from uh, Nova Scotia Health did indicate that they would follow up with a, uh, a reply to the question of um, a reciprocal policy um, as to whether or not long -term, seniors in long-term care would, would be interested in that, I'll call it assured access for veterans, uh, if the the beds are the what's the word I'm looking for? If the sorry, if the contract beds are are full, and they did say that they would provide that response through seniors in long-term care. But I, I I'm wondering if and maybe maybe it doesn't require a formal motion. But I'm wondering if the the chair might uh, follow up with seniors in long-term care to get a response to that question um, kind of endorsed by all committee members if, if that's a, a friendly thing to do. If, if I, I'm happy to make a motion, but... I think to your point, MLA Jessam, I'm not sure we need a motion really as a committee. I think uh, the, re the recommendation I might make is we give them an opportunity to respond to us, and if by the next committee we haven't received a response at that point in time, uh, maybe then we could... Uh, Proceed with a formal request. Does that does that uh, go well to the committee? Uh, MLA Taggart. Well, I just I, I don't disagree. Other than to say that I think you know uh, we're almost asking them to set policy, you know, and that's not typically done at the you know what I mean at, at this level. But I I may read that wrong. I don't know. But for I, I know if I think it was me. I would just that was answering the question. I I would. I'm not so, going to set policy but, here. You know that happens in the house or whatever. But yeah. so, so I think I, I, if I remember the okay, MLA Barcos. And we'll Thank you. I think we're fine with that. The um, Nova Scotia Health uh, stated they were going to send us a reply um, in their comments. So I, I think we're fine. Um, uh, uh, yeah, just sending a letter. Maybe we should wait. Like for the, if it's not here by next month, then then maybe send something though. If that's fine with the. All right, thank you. Uh, is, uh, seeing there's no other business, uh, we will, uh, our next meeting will be May 21st, 2024. Our topic will be medical coverage for veterans. Witnesses will be Medivy Blue Cross and Veterans Affairs Canada. So uh, with no other business, we are now adjourned. Thank you.